Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jacob Smith. I, I dropped it in the, uh, in the chat here. Um, I'm with a company called Ultimetric. Uh, we are the co-hosts for uh, this evening. My uh, friend and colleague, Ryan Robinson, uh, is joining us as well. Um, Ultimetric is a Southfield-based uh, global, global presence uh, software services firm that specializes in what we call global transformation. Um, so essentially helping large companies stay ahead of the curve with, with technology change, basically, and drive innovation from within their teams. Um, one of uh, Ultimetric's big efforts in Detroit uh, is, is called the Collider, which is the team that myself and, and Ryan are on, um, which is a community-facing branch of the larger Ultimetric team. Ultimetric, I got my hat on. Um, and essentially what we're working on is building, uh, building up the tech ecosystem and bringing together uh, software professionals to learn and grow and connect um, and build meaningful community. So in, in saying that, uh, normally we would be inviting you to uh, come and visit us in our physical location located in downtown Detroit, uh, where we regularly run all sorts of really awesome programs for uh, software uh, professionals. Um, we do lots of programming with Lee and Henry, um, mostly focused on training and some other things. Um, obviously right now we're not doing physical programs, but instead have shifted uh, to, to be really heavily leaning on, on virtual programming to kind of make the most of, of this moment. Um, and so that's how we find ourselves here today. Um, but I do just want to point out that we'll drop the resources in the chat here. Uh, we are constantly hosting uh, exciting programming geared towards software professionals. And we really excited, we really uh, encourage you to, to connect with us and, uh, and, and stay in the loop with, with, all, with those types of programs. So with that said, I'm gonna get out of the way as quickly as possible by handing it over to uh, my friend and someone I, I admire uh, quite a bit, uh, Mr. Lee Caldwell. Uh, so Lee is a team leader at Amrock, uh, a local um, company that he's gonna be able to explain better than me. Uh, we are here today um, talking about managing software teams uh, during I, I think we said during a crisis, I think specifically we're talking about managing software teams during a crisis that requires everyone to be working remotely. Uh, lots of folks are kind of um, all of a sudden working remotely who may not have otherwise been in that situation. And therefore uh, there is kind of a lot of haphazard things happening, different, um, different things. Uh, so what we wanted to do was, was come together and have kind of this candid conversation around what are some effective leadership and management strategies uh, during a moment like this when everybody is suddenly um, separated and where stress uh, and, and distractions are high. Um, so with that, I wanna go ahead and hand it over to Lee and encourage everybody throughout the presentation to drop questions um, in the chat box and we will get to those um, either at the end of the presentation or if it makes sense, we can uh, slide those in as well. So Lee, without further ado, take it away. All right, sweet. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, as, as always, it's great to be here. Um, and I and, uh, definitely give kudos to you and your, your organization for having a consistent programming throughout the, um, through the, throughout the quarantine. Like uh, from day one, uh, Jacob and Ryan have been like on top of making sure that there's programming for uh, development leaders, development team members, and just everyone in that development ecosystem, the software development ecosystem. And it's been really valuable both, both for the people presenting and the people who's just kind of going to those different workshops and programs. Because it's real easy for people to just stop and say, oh, quarantine happened, uh, let's, let's see what's gonna happen. But like when you, when you have that, that vision and those values and you, you have that focus on doing something that's larger than yourself, uh, then you, you know the importance of continuing and still moving forward with whatever it is that you're doing. And we're going to jump into that in, the, in our conversation today. Um, so here, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen uh, just so we can, I'm going to start off with the flow of today's presentation. I just have to make sure I share the correct screen here. All right. Can you see my screen? All right, sweet. All right, so in today's presentation, I wanna hit on four main things. 
Uh, and these are like, it's a million things you want to think about when uh, leading the team during the crisis. And, and the context that I'm using here is the software development team, uh, because I, I am a software development team leader. So that's the context I'm you know, doing this presentation in. Um, so it's a million things you want to think about, but I just wanted to kind of cater this conversation around four main topics, uh, maintaining vision and values. Uh, two, learning to embrace the storm. Three, communicate strategically. And then four, prioritize your greatest assets, and that, that being your team members. Um, so I see something in the chat here. Oh, sweet. Um, so real quick, I'm going to time box each of those things to about 15 minutes so we can try to keep uh, the conversation in about an hour time frame. Um, then we'll start off with the step zero. I'll give a quick intro. Got a little disclaimer I want to throw in there. And then um, we'll do the presentation overview, then we'll jump right into it. <clears throat> and, and Lee, we'll, uh, we'll, my, we'll keep an eye on the chat so you can focus on the presentation. Sweet, sweet, perfect. All right, so I am Lee Caldwell. I've been leading teams, organizations, people, students, etc., for over 10 years. Um, uh, probably for, for, yeah, over 10 years, probably around 15 years, uh, different capacities, whether it's an organization, whether it's um, on a school board, whether it's at a school, whether it's uh, at, in my current role as a team leader and scrum master at Amrock. Um, and I've learned a lot in my experience there. And it, it kind of just compiles on each other, especially having uh, leadership experience in different industries and in different sectors and at different capacities. Um, but I will say that a lot of the things that I learned kind of transferred to different spaces. And I feel like it's made me a stronger leader as a technical leader uh, and just in, that, um, in this software development space. Um, so I do want to give a quick disclaimer. Like uh, I know generally, uh, you give presentations or you have presentations and you know you go through this powerpoint presentation and then at the end we have questions and we open the floor for people to you know join the conversation i want to do things a little bit differently and i am going to ask that you know we, we all kind of participate in this uh, this presentation will be more of a workshop style um and i really do feel like the the best way to learn in the settings like this is to learn from each other. Um, and I just, I'm just curious as to what other opinions are out there. Uh, so there will be parts in the presentation where I have like structured questions and that'd be an opportunity for us to kind of join in the conversation. So don't be afraid to unmute yourself and chime in and jump in uh, during those structure periods. Uh, and I, I do wanna keep the, each of the sections time box to about 15 minutes and I'll try to gauge that the best I can because I do wanna be mindful of people's time. Uh, but, but also I wanna get as much value as we can out of this. Um, so, so yeah, just, uh, you know, just kind of think of us as family. It's a, it's a pretty, you know, it's not a super large group. So I think it is room for us to have this uh, more conversational style uh, rather than you know, me just kind of spitting out some information and you know, hoping something stick or, you know, you having to write down questions and wait for the, the end to get those addressed. Hey, quickly, Lee, before you dive in, can you explain what a Scrum Master is real quick? All right, sweet. Uh, so uh, in the software development life cycle uh, and in software development spaces, uh, you have someone on the team who masters the flow of the, the flow of the work or manages the flow of the work. Uh, so Typically, a software development team will consist of software developers, um, maybe a Q, QE, QA, a business analyst, a QE, QA being a quality analyst or a quality engineer, may have a business analyst, may have someone who uh, represents uh, data, so maybe a data analyst. Uh, so the scrum master is the person who's really in charge of making sure that there's a constant and consistent flow of work being done and that the work has been completed success successfully. Uh, so they would generally manage um, like any charts that depict how much work they can get done in, in a certain time frame um, and the value of that work that's getting done in a certain time frame. Uh, so it, it's pretty much the, the people who kind of manage that workflow. 
Uh, does that properly answer the question or whoever had it? Please so. All right, sweet. Um, and then over at AMROC, um, we have Scrum Master Team Leads. So we, we, uh, we manage the flow of work, uh, but the team leader aspect is really um, managing the, the team and, and really uh, taking care of the team. And, and I, I use the word manage, I, like I know that AMROC is not within our culture to use the word manage, but we, we like to use the word lead and talk about leading teams rather than managing teams. Uh, and then we, we are proponents of servant leadership, and I will get to that piece in the presentation as well. Sweet, sweet. All right, so again, the overview of it. So at first, we're going to start off talking about vision and values. Then we're going to talk uh, briefly about embracing the storm and communicating strategically and then prioritizing uh, your greatest asset or your team. All right, sweet. So any questions before we jump right on in? All right. All right, anybody know what this is here? A forest. Yeah, it has a special name. This is the <laughs> crooked forest. So you got these trees, you know, they, they all grew crooked in this forest in Poland. Um, and you, you'll see like crooked trees, you'll see them often. Sometimes you'll see them like by the water, you'll see them like uh, on, a, on a hill, sometimes you'll see them in very windy areas. Uh, but you have these crooked trees and like uh, trees are very resilient. You know, when they, when they have strong roots and they have um, a will to compete for the sunlight, they, they become very resilient and they make sure that they do whatever they need to do to, um, to survive. So uh, oftentimes this happens when um, either there's a strong wind or there's a landslide, mudslide, uh, or there's um, a side of a uh, piece of land that's more nutrient rich than the other side, or there's something that's blocking the sunlight so the tree will have to grow around that obstacle. Um, so this is like just a depiction of pivoting in, in nature. So you think you're about to grow, grow straight upwards and then something happens and now you start to have to grow on the side a little bit. You have to kind of dodge and duck and find your way to reach the sunlight so you can continue to get that energy that you need to sustain life. So in, in many situations, if you have that shade that's blocking the sunlight, uh, the tree has two options. It can either wither and die, or it can change its course. Hmm. And we have the same fate with business, like in, in, that, in everything that we do. So when things happen, when we have external factors that come and in, in, like impose themselves into our space, we have two options. We can wither or die, or we can change our course. And as we come into the corona, you know, I call it the corona season, as we came into the corona season, you saw certain organizations um, at the start, they, a lot of organizations determined their fate at the start. It was either, hey, we're going into this and we're going to get something out of it, or I think we're going to shut down shop. And you see a lot of the organizations made that decision at the beginning. And with a lot of the organizations that, that sustained and decided not to wither and die, uh, it was two common things that I feel like are necessary for them to sustain and to be successful. One is have, um, have a vision or some goals or something that they're reaching towards that's bigger than themselves. Uh, and for, for these trees, it's the sunlight. You know, you're, you're reaching towards the sunlight. That is something that it, it has to go towards. Uh, for a company, it might be OKRs. Uh, it, might be, it might be their company goals. It might be their mission, it might be their vision, it might be this thing that they just see something greater than themselves. Uh, so that is necessary for, for you to, to sustain during these tough times. Uh, and then the second thing that is needed for these trees to sustain life is they have to be really well rooted. Uh, like it, it'll be a big difference between a tree that is able to pivot and grow or a tree that just eventually becomes tumbleweed. 
you know, you, you got to have some deep roots and you got to have solid roots. And what those roots are to me is values. You know, what are your company values? What are the things that keep your company and your team like grounded? And what, what is that foundation for your company and your team? Hmm. What? Is it is a change in strategy without a change in vision? What is your team sign? What are your team roots? Hmm. Yep, so, so this, on this part, I, I want us to think about our own experience, our own teams, our own company. Like, if you don't have a vision and a set of values that you're upholding, uh, like now is the time to think about it. So, so now I want to open up just a, a quick conversation on, you know, just quickly discussing t to each other, like, what are, what are your team values? What are your team's visions? Like uh, when we talk about, like when I have, have here, what is your team sign? It, it's, what is the values? What is that goal? What is that OKR that you're reaching to that's more important than just the individual or more important than the individuals on that team? It's that glue that, that everyone's kind of reaching towards. Like if you don't have that, like let's, let's, let's talk about that. Let's, let's try to think really deeply about what it is that, that we're here for. Now, I am a patient person. <laughs> I can I can add if no one wants to 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 speak up. Uh, so so for for me and 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 the team that I work with, uh, our biggest thing as a company we were not remote. Um, so traditionally we're not we're not a remote company. So when the whole Corona season came came about, uh, we had to make that pivot. But I think our foundation was the fact that. Um, we, we, we value our culture and we were able to like prep uh, enough so that when it was time to, to go totally remote, that we had that infrastructure in place. And I think having that preparation and having that infrastructure in place is what is causing us to thrive right now during this, uh, you know, we, we couldn't foresee how long this was gonna be. And right now we're, we're, we're at a point where we're thriving in the remote uh, space. I can speak for us. I mean, we, we were running a physical space. Our strategy was very, very dependent on driving traffic to that physical space um, and also hiring people very quickly. I mean, that was, that was a big focus of ours, which kind of uh, both of those things really froze immediately with, with, the, with the pandemic outbreak. Um, so for us, uh, I think to, to Lee's point, you know, it really came to distilling down our values, kind of our bigger mission, which when we really thought about it, it was like, well, why are we driving people to physical events? It's so that we can be creating community and help and, and engaging people and helping them uh, grow and connect. So then once we're able to kind of zoom out and detach that from it needs to be physical, then we're able to kind of dive in and, and, and really guide our, our virtual event strategy. Now we've released a YouTube channel and a blog and different things that we had kind of talked about at a high level, but had never actually executed on. And it's it shifted to the forefront of our strategy, um, which stays consistent with really what we were always trying to do. Sweet, sweet. Here, I'm gonna drop two, two examples in here. One, one from my, uh, my software development team that I work with. Uh, so at our company, we have a, a list of goals and OKRs. And like one of them, you know, stems from one of uh, Quicken Loans goals. Um, and like uh, just the fact that when the coronavirus happened, and or when the uh, quarantines happened, like the fact that Quicken Loans was not wavering on those goals meant that every tier under them had to have that same resilience. And like that meant that the things that we were working towards prior, like the, those don't stop. Um, and like uh, one of those, one of our uh, trains initiatives or one of our, um, I guess, department's initiatives is to, um, uh, make sure that we're completing all of our feature level work and like in, and in order for us to do that, like we can't slack off or like kind of give up different uh, things to, you know, because 
uh, situation happens. Um, so just having those higher level goals from that organizational standpoint help ground us in that regard. And then on another front, like I, you know, I work with Emory uh, doing DevU, which is a new business that we started uh, within the, the year. And we really focus on teaching uh, people coding who otherwise wouldn't have the ability to, um, to learn, you know, whether it be, you know, it's really competitive to get into and pricey to get into a lot of the boot camps that's around town. Um, and a lot of people just don't know where to start that journey. Uh, so one thing that really kept us going is that, you know, even though this thing stops us from meeting in person, like we still wanted a way to teach people how to code and, and really it, it opened up a door for us to start really beefing up our online material and giving us a um, just a bank of online material that we can leverage in the future. Like we can use this material and we can like package it up and do different things with it. And it allows us to be more mobile in how we, in our, um, I guess our overall work strategy. Um, and then just thinking about your team's roots. Like if you don't have company values or, or a team's, a set of team values, then this is time to really start thinking about that. Like really start thinking about what is it that you want your team to specialize in. Like I'm able to um, kind of spit off my team values, you know, just off the back of my, my head because that's something that we, we live by. You know, we, we live by innovation, quality, efficiency, and uh, just doing the right thing. And those are the four things that we really lean to um, on our team. And, and those, those aren't just decisions that I've made on my own. I work with my team to develop those, those qualities and those uh, values that we hold true to. So whenever it is that we, um, we're approaching a problem, we're thinking about how does, uh, how does this get us to our goal? And how can we, I guess, manifest our values into solving this problem? And oftentimes it, it keeps us all aligned and on the same page. Hey, Lee, we've got a great question here from Henry. So what strategies would you suggest in terms of uh, beginning to develop team values? Um, like I, I actually like that's one of the, the fun parts for me is um, kind of developing that that team. Uh, uh, like a, with Elmark, we call it a team agreement. Um, but it, it really involves bringing the entire team together and talking about what it is that they value as individuals and then what, what it is that they value as a team. And then taking those two things and seeing that, you know, if there's some common threads that can be agreed upon and seeing, you know, you wanna try to create those values organically. You don't want to just impose those values onto the team. Uh, in some instances, that may be the case that you have to, you know, some things, you know, just, just have to be. Uh, but you do wanna at least get some input and allow for your team members to give input in terms of what those values that they're, they're gonna be expected to adhere to and to hold each other accountable for. All right, uh, any more questions, comments? All right, so one other thing I really learned and really um, appreciate about uh, working in a crisis is just the, the ability to learn to embrace the storm. I know um, like as a kid you go through, or I guess I'll say for myself, I went through different phases of how I felt about rain and the storm. Um, as a kid, I used to hate it. Like absolutely hands down you know rain meant i had to go inside i couldn't play in the, play outside anymore it meant that you know the fun stops you know you're stuck in the house blah this that and another uh but then you know as you get older and that, as you experience life a bit more you find other things to do so it's like you, you learn to tolerate it it's like okay I, I guess i can deal with this uh and i will say it was two things really made me learn to embrace the rain. Uh, one thing was uh, gardening. Like uh, when I, you know, I used to work at a school and I, part of that, I would manage our school's garden. And like, 
like when it rained, like I noticed that, you know, when, when you come back the next day, like the plants were just so much richer after the rain, especially when it was uh, the, the season to, to start reaping the, the benefits of your, of your plants. Uh, like the, the, it's just, the, um, you, you'll see that it'll be so much more abundance in what you planted after a heavy rain. So at that point, that's when I started to get ex a little bit excited about the rain. It's like, oh yeah, it's raining hard. It's going to be sweet because tomorrow I'm going to pick, you know, pick my zucchini and you know, I'm going to have this rich fruit that I have, these rich fruits and vegetables at my disposal. And that, that really kind of started to get me into embracing the rain and then really start to get me to really get excited about the rain. And I, I feel like we have to take that same energy around a crisis. Like uh, at first, it, it's real easy to point out a lot of uh, the negative aspects of the crisis and, and all the negative things that's go coming along with having to work from home uh, and having to work from home for extended periods of time. But we have to look a level deeper to determine are there benefits and what are those benefits that we can, that we can leverage and that we can actually embrace or even celebrate. Um, so... I know that for me, I was able to look into the fact that a lot for my team, a lot of my team members are, uh, they commute for um, about 45 minutes to an hour into the workplace. So this quarantine, you know, it took away that commute. So for my development team, they found that they have more focused hours in, in their workday. So whereas, you know, there's been, and even, uh, I guess, in some mornings, that commute could easily be an hour and a half, where that hour and a half spent from getting from point A to point B prior to this uh, quarantine, they can now use that, team, that time for uh, something that will move us forward in our work. They can use that time to something that's, that's uh, either contributing to innovation or contributing to the, the, work, the workplace uh, needs and goals. Um, and we were able to further leverage that by um, shifting our, our meetings. Uh, so I, I know that for my team, they like to have uh, just a large block of time that they can chunk off just so they can dedicate towards development. And combining like the, the, the removal of these, um, these commutes and combining that with uh, just moving all of our meetings to a certain period of the day, like they're able to really capitalize on the work day. And like, I, I kid you not, like we've been really getting a lot more work than we expected to, like in this first, uh, what, we're in, uh, I don't even know, six weeks? I don't know how long it's been. But um, like in terms of like the goals that we set and the, the amount of work we plan to get done during this period, we've been ahead of our schedule since the start of, quor of quarantine which has been amazing because you get, you get even more benefits from that. So now you got time and flexibility to, um, to do more innovative things in the workplace. And we're not, we're not suffering from uh, being overworked or feeling like it's too much. And we get time to really innovate on how we solve for some of the issues that's been thrown at us. Because you know, even though we get this little extra time in there, uh, we're still, as a business, we're still doing a lot of pivoting to determine what's the next best thing to do. Um, but when you feel like you're getting a lot of pivot and you don't have the adequate time to do what you expect it to do, that really can weigh down on you and your team. So, so just finding that benefit and really exploiting that benefit and using it in a way to make the team better and kind of bring us up to success really helped me in the team. Uh, I guess as a whole. Hey Lee, uh, before you move on, so I uh, really awesome point there. Um, great question here from Henry again. So how uh, he's asking basically how how were these benefits recognized by the team? So kind of in what way did you sell that to your team, or was it something that folks kind of automatically got on board with? Um, actually, the team uh, it was it was kind of a shared decision. Um, so we did recognize that, um, that we were getting more hours out the day. That was, that was kind of an immediate thing. Like, I was like, oh, 
damn, I don't have to drive, you know, three hours out of my day to get to and from work. And it's like, okay, sweet. And then uh, like, it's been like a, a common thing where it's like, you know, our work day is always, you know, it's, it's hard, you know, when we got these meetings in between, you know, it's that kind of in, interjects the work day. And for developers, like they're, they're kind of like creatives. And, and I say that because I, I like to dabble with my keyboard and bass and stuff. Like when you're in the zone, like you're in the zone. And if somebody pull you out of that zone, it takes a while to get back into that zone. And sometimes it doesn't even happen. So when you're in the zone, you, you want to really capitalize that time. Um, so so they, they kind of talked about the, um, just the, the detriment that, uh, that having these choppy meetings and the meetings kind of interrupting and interjecting into their, their workflow. And so we just kind of made a decision. Okay, first of all, we've been made the decision to have stand up at the end of the day. Uh, but then we had a conversation with our product owner to say, hey, uh, we're as a team, we're deciding that we're not going to do meetings uh, uh, after or prior to one o'clock. Like any meeting that we have as a team has to be after one o'clock. And preferably, we want meetings after three o'clock. So we, we did leave a little bit of wiggle room because our product owner, he, he, he got to work early. So he left, you know, he leave uh, you know, around four or five o'clock. So we did. You know, we, we did have some negotiation around giving him some wiggle room just so that he can have ample time to get everything that he needed us for in there as well. But we had a hard, fast rule of no meetings before one o'clock unless, unless it was very urgent. I did break the rule tomorrow. I do have a meeting at nine o'clock, but it's, you know, you know, stuff happens. So this, this leads me into the questions that I want to pose to the group. Um, what are some of the potential benefits or benefits that, that you can draw from the quarantine that, you, that you've experienced or, or that you just may have just thought about just in thinking or just what are some of those potential benefits that you've gotten? I, I know Jacob shared around, you know, beefing up his, uh, uh, like, um, web presence and like a lot of the blog and, and stuff like that. Uh, what are some other benefits that we can gain from this? Don't be shy, y'all. Okay, I can speak. This is Kiana. Um, just for, so to start off, personally, benefits um, that I've seen is just you know in my home life, like like you said, Lee. Um, I mean, I don't drive three hours um, to work in. Um, to work in home, but I do drive like 30 minutes back and forth. And so uh, given on 94, it could be an hour one way and an hour, you know, two hours. Um, so I do value that time that I have here to spend with my family. I have a daughter um, and, you know, just, just to kind of see what she's doing. Like for the first time, like ever, like really, um, I've, I've been in my home for like 10 years, I actually got outside and planted some flowers. Like I don't do that. I thought that was so the bomb. I felt one with the earth. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but as it relates to work, I think because um, we built that foundation like at Amrod um, on our team, we already had that community, that good communication. And we really um, valued each other and we respected each other and we trusted each other. Um, on our team before the whole quarantine. So once we had to, you know, start this new work norm of being entirely remote, um, I kind of think it just kind of brought us to, uh, together a little bit more. So what I'm finding with my team is that the collaboration mm -hmm. is on 10. Um, it, it's not a good thing that, you know, our, our devs are sitting at our desk and they're just in the zone and they don't get up and take lunch. You know, we really want to encourage that because that's something um, you need to take care of your health. But I will say like, they will get on the chat, call each other. Hey, check this out. Can you co-review this? Let's do it together. Let's test this out together. And so they are, they are cranking out so much work. It's, you know, and, and I know like in, in the office, you have distractions, you may have people coming to your desk and talking to you and pulling you away. Of course, you have the kitchen meetups and, and you know, you kind of want to chat, which is 
awesome. Like I wouldn't take that away, but the focus that we have being at our own individual desk in our own individual homes and then coming together um, to develop some awesome has, has been phenomenal. So I think those are one of the things that we've embracing and that I see is working uh, on my team. So. Sweet, sweet. So I heard two things. So removing those distractions uh, and also just the, the improved collaboration. And then yeah. the third, I guess being uh, having that extra time to get that garden going. Yeah. <laughs> Right, exactly. Uh, I'll share. Um, so I think the biggest thing for me, uh, and, and this goes outside of work as well, is that um, like we've always had like these technologies, Zoom and virtual meetings and being able to like virtually get together with people. Uh, but, you know, we've all either been kind of hesitant about it or it's just been like in the back pocket and we haven't really like taken advantage of it but I think the quarantine has caused us not only in our personal relationships but also from a business standpoint to like take advantage of the technology that's already been there and leverage that in our relationships um, and I think it's I mean it's to see the creative creative aspect that people have used the zooms and the go-to trainings and in whatever other form you use um, to see people have I mean, even for you, Lee, we, we threw you a party and, and there were all the people that came through on, on the Zoom. I thought that was like unique and I thought that was cool. Uh, I have a, a weekly game night with other friends and we all just hop on Zoom and we have to rethink the way we engage with other people. But I think moving on into the future, once we get back to whatever our new normal is, that now we have this other other aspect of, of being able to communicate and touch out and reach out with people and stay connected. Mm -hmm. Sweet. So what I pull from that is uh, just better leverage in the technology that's out there. Sweet. And I also pull from that, uh, that you have a, a game night that you haven't invited me to. That may or may not be true. <laughs> now, what are some other benefits out of this time period? Uh, I probably could provide a different perspective. Maybe. Uh, for me, it's been a little bit of like uh, validation in a sense. I, I worked from home for two or three years, like a few years ago. And uh, so I'm used to working from home and, and having to do this in a sense. Uh, and then like right before the pandemic happened, like actually the day that they were sending everybody home to work from home, I, uh, and this was, I was back at the office at this time. I, I was actually in the process of putting my two weeks notice in because I wanted to start my own thing, you know? Mm. And, um, but before that, my plan was like, okay, well, you know what? I, I want I want to start my business in a sense where I want to have a remote development team. I don't want to have to have an office and make people come to the office. And and I, and that was my idea, like, through the whole time. It's like, you know what? I want to I do something more remote. And this kind of forced it in a sense, like, okay, well, that was maybe it wasn't a bad idea in a sense in trying to do something like that because um because now it's like you're by, by having to do it this way you're prepared for 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 either way you know we, we can work this way we can work in the office it doesn't really matter so it was more so like a validation of the fact that this can be done and it can work and now we're kind of being forced to actually val uh figure out how to do it you know Mm hmm. So it's validating something that you are willing to test out or you are trying to test out. So now you get that validation. And not only that, but it, it's, it, it may become the new norm. So it, it may be a lot easier to get that that business up and running now that, you know, this may be seen as the new norm, especially in the software development space and in a lot of other spaces as well. Sweet. Thanks for adding that, man. All right, sweet. So, so, so we heard validation, uh, actually leveraging technology that we already have, uh, increased collaboration, uh, and then just that increased time. And there was one more in there. Uh, I should have been writing these down. I'm gonna have to go back to the video. Uh, but, but the thing is, like, oh, you got something, Jacob? Sorry, I was just gonna say, uh, uh, Derek asked a great question, and I'm just kind of curious to hear your take. Um, you know, when we talk about uh, something such as, you know, shifting to remote work um, and some of the other benefits that, that you're covering, uh, to what degree do you think 
these things can or, or will kind of carry over into the uh, post, uh, you know, post COVID time that, that we have coming next. Mm -hmm. Man, I, I think that would be very dependent on the particular organization. Like, uh, but I, I do believe that it opens up the door and opens up the minds of a lot of people who didn't think that it was possible, who didn't think it would be practical, who didn't like it was a non-negotiable where it's like, you know, this is the only way to do things because, you know, this is how it's done. Uh, so, so this, this, this um, predicament that we're in now uh, proves otherwise because there's a lot of businesses and there are certain industries where they're getting more uh, business and more volume than they have ever and they, they're able to sustain that and they're, they're able to meet those needs. Uh, but, but you also have um, others where, where it might not be so practical and you have businesses where they might be feeding money into trying to make it work and it's just not working for them. Uh, so, so I do believe that it will serve as an eye opener. Um, but to say that it will completely change the landscape, you know, that, that definitely takes time. But this is definitely uh, something that will, will kind of disrupt the way we think about uh, work and working remotely. And that's my uh, non-expert opinion. <laughs> Okay, this is Adam. I was gone for the first half hour, so I apologize. I was on a call too late. Um, but I just wanted to add one of the one of the main things that I've gotten out of um, something I can do different during quarantine is I tend to not be a very strict manager, um, especially about little nitpicky things. And it's afforded me the opportunity to use this as an excuse to um, push some more structure onto my team, um, which has benefited in a number of ways that I think would carry back over if we, if we came back to having to work in the same place. Um, such things as like tasking out stories, um, as opposed to just letting the stories roll. Um, things like that have been really, really beneficial and, and really putting structure around stand up and some of the other things that go into being agile. I never, Hey, I didn't start out in this role really being a, a large proponent of agile in the first place. But a lot of a lot of this has forced me to uh, kind of dive into that more head first, and and it gives me an excuse to place that structure on my team when initially I hadn't had it from the beginning. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Like that's a, that's a great one as well. Like um, like it does allow you to like reinforce some things because it, it's like a good turning point for a team. Like it's a great time to come have that. Uh, I call it that come to Jesus moment where you kind of re revamp and kind of refactor the way that you do things as a team. And, and it's interesting you say that because, uh, you know, that uh, a lot of times those uh, them strictly scrum things, like those are usually the first that, you know, go off on the wayside for me, um, especially like when I find a good groove and like where we're moving well as a team, I tend to like kind of toss those things uh, over the, you know, over the, off the plank somewhere. Uh, but then, you know, things happen and it's like, okay, let's get back to the basics and let's really buckle down on those things. Like, uh, even during this time, like, uh, like I will have very loose standups. Like we, we, you know, we do the work, work, work throughout the day. Then we have our afternoon stand up around three o'clock. And like, uh, like a lot of times during that stand up, you know, we haven't talked to people. So we'll, we'll kind of just kind of, you know, chop it up and just have conversation during that stand up. And then uh, one of my team members said, hey, hey you know, I, I like that we have this time to, to just have this conversation as a team. But sometime, you know, uh, you know, I have somewhere to be at, at a certain time. So, um, you know, or I got a certain meeting that I want to get to. So, you know, we got to make sure we get our stand up done, Lee. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> so it's like, okay, kind of pulling back and like being strict about the things, especially like if, if that team member, uh, if a team member brings it up to you. Because uh, like on the same note, like everyone enjoys that time to talk, but it's like, all right, let's get our stand up done. Then we talk. And that, you know, small things that, you know, kind of just kind of stay on point that we have to stay on top of. Um, so I, I did have a, a, the second question where it was around, like, at least recognizing the downsides of it, uh, of this, uh, of the quarantine or whatever the crisis may be, uh, recognizing it and like just making sure that we're not ignoring it because it is, it's easy to get caught into, okay, we're going to embrace the good things out of it and only pay attention to the good things. But as a leader, 
um, you have to be at least um, conscious of the downside and you have to at least, you know, try to play, you, you need to be conscious of it so you can kind of play that protective role to kind of protect your team from those downsides. Um, and so, you know, definitely spend some time to think about what are those real downsides and also spend some time to think about how you can prevent them from uh, interrupting the flow of the team prior to them becoming an issue. All right, so are, are there any questions before we move on to our communicate strategically? All right, sweet. Um, so communication during a crisis is super important, like especially during this corona season, because I know that team members have a lot of questions and like they just want to know whether it's for uh, their own like just mental being, or rather it's for uh, like for their for like for their specific work purpose. Because uh, typically during a crisis, you you get a lot of people who step up to try to make decisions and who do make decisions. And sometimes, depending on where your team lies in that hierarchy, it may mean that your team is the one that's pivoting towards you know whatever decision is being made. Uh, and as a leader, it's important that we we were able to effectively communicate with our team and in a, in a business context. So what that means to me is uh, we're effectively able to relay the right information to the right people at the right time. And we're communicating in a way that stimulates a dialogue that improves the, the ability to make a decision and to make the right decision. Um, because you don't want to be pivoting you know, left and right, left and right, left and right. So as a leader, I, I feel like it's part of our, partly our duty to make sure that we're having those conversations before the, it hits the team to make this drastic change in direction. Um, so I, I just want to speak real quickly on just some best practices for communicating during the crisis. Um, so I broke it down into three main questions, like what to communicate, how to communicate, and when to communicate. Uh, so in terms of what to communicate, like I know that for my team, you know, I have one person who's always interested in what the business is doing, like, uh, like how, how is business doing? Like, what's, like, are we getting a lot of volume? Is the volume high? You know, will, will the volume plummet? What's the trends looking like? Uh, is there a chance that we'll have layoffs soon? Is there a chance that are we hiring? Like they, they always interested in those types of questions. Uh, then, then I have another team member who might be interested, oh, when are we coming back to the office? Are we expected to come back to the office? What's going on with the office? And the thing is, like for me, it, it, it means to really learn my team so that I can answer those questions before they even ask them. So like, you know, once a week or, you know, I'll send out uh, an email that, that points out a lot of those things that they used to ask previously so that they're not continuously asking those questions. So it's more of a flow of, you know, just, you know, they're expected to get this information. Um, and uh, uh, and it, it covers like most of the major things that they, that they would want to know at most given times. Uh, so one thing that it really helped me uh, do was really to understand the larger context as well, because, you know, you have, you know, I, at least I have five different team members who have different communication needs and being able to take all those things and package it up into one quick email to just kind of stay afloat of the information that's needed from my development team. Um, and it, yeah, it kind of, it helps me as a leader, but it also helps the team kind of stay at, I guess, a certain level of composure. Uh, because it, it is a lot of, it's a lot to take in. Uh, and it, it can be very, I guess, worrisome for some team members, especially not knowing what the future looks like. And I feel like it's our job as a leader to really step in that place to um, communicate the right information, uh, but also at the right time. Um, so moving to, to how to communicate, like one thing that I found 
important for my team is that the method of communication matters. Like, like I said, my team, we don't, we don't like to, you know, throw all these ad hoc meetings throughout the middle of the day and throughout the course of the day. So we try to package a lot of the content, or I try to package a lot of the content of a meeting into an email um, when necessary. And then, you know, I may deliver some information via our stand up and I may have other me means of uh, delivering different information. So the, the important piece of that is really thinking, uh, thinking about uh, what are you communicating? Why is it imp important that you communicate this information? And what's the best way to, ex to communicate this information? And then lastly, like, what do you expect to be the outcome of you communicating this information? Like, is it to, um, is it to try to make a decision quicker? Is it to try to make a better decision? Is it to kind of ease the pains or the worries of your team members? Like, and really understanding the purpose and the, the takeaway of that information exchange, let that guide how you deliver that information. Um, and then lastly, I'd like to hit on is, is when to communicate. Uh, during a crisis, I feel that it's important to communicate early and often. Uh, as, as I find out information, I make sure to relay it to my team. Like we have uh, different meetings that, you know, we have our different leadership meetings. We have, you know, uh, meetings across all of our family of companies. And as soon as I get that information, you know, I type up a, a quick little draft of um, the, me the meeting minutes. You know, I put it in my own words and it's, you know, sometimes a little entertaining. Uh, and then I shoot that out to the team as soon as, as soon as I have it done, just so they can have a rough idea uh, before I even forget about that information. And though it may seem like, oh, well, they don't need to know that yet, or it's not important for them yet. Just, you know, knowledge is power. And, and you know, when you don't have that knowledge, you can sometimes feel defenseless. So you really want to step into the shoes of your team uh, to make sure that they have the tools that they need to be comfortable in their role and in their job. So um, I do want to open the floor to any other, like, um, I guess, best, practices for communicating, uh, especially during this time? Like, has anyone found themselves themselves doing different practices to um, communicate with their team or across their companies? Um, I have a question about just the anticipating your team members' communication. Because if you, how do you find like a healthy balance between anticipating what they're going to say? And then if they do say something different, you, you know, can you let go of the idea of what you thought they would say, you know, so that you're clearly hearing them or, you know, do you find yourself sometimes being like, oh, I thought you were going to say this. So you marry that idea versus like being able to be a little more flexible in your listening. Um, so when I say anticipate the anticipating like their needs in terms of communication, like I, I guess it's more like ahead of time. So it's not like while they're, while they're talking or like during that moment, but like if, um, like say tonight, like, uh, you know, I may know that it's been a week since I sent my last like um, update on the company or update on the team status. Um, and then it's like, okay, it's been about a week. I know that, you know, this team member will probably be asking about this tomorrow. So let me shoot an email out right now to get that covered. And I guess more of that type of anticipating, okay. more than like in conversation. Like okay. definitely like in conversation, you know, I'm, I'm definitely all ears and I advise anyone to, to really be all ears in conversation. But just in terms of like, um, I guess, kind of knowing what, or having an idea of what your team members' needs are in terms of information, okay. uh, being able to deliver that before they ask for it. Thank you. So any questions, comments, additions, subtractions? Divisions or multiplications? <laughs> so we got a comment from Nita here. She said, communicating most electronically across a larger team runs the risk of people being less sensitive or considerate. 
or more short and abrupt? That's a really good point, Nita. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you recommend that team leaders keep uh, team members aware of the human aspect of their communication uh, in that context? That's a great question. Can, can you repeat the beginning of the part of that question? Yep. So basically like when, in, in shifting to kind of short form electronic communication, like a Slack or text or whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. um, I've experienced this too. It's like there's a tendency to be uh, shorter or more uh, transactional or abrupt with communication. So how do you kind of maintain the, the human touch of communication even when you're not seeing each other and communicating in person? Man, I feel like if it's one of those important messages or if it's um, something where you're, where it's, um, where it may have a large impact on like a team member's work and what they're doing day to day or what they could be doing, I think those have to happen like with the face. Um, that I feel, I do feel that that could be very dangerous to send like important information via a text or via a email. Um, I think it can be followed up with a text or an email, but I, I definitely will have the important and larger conversations like, uh, or the more impactful conversations. Like for us, it'll be during our stand up, which we have daily, you know, we have our daily stand up. I'll mention that at that point. And, and I guess for, for our teams and for a lot of scrum teams, like they having that daily stand up, is a great opportunity to um start at least dropping information on things uh, i do feel like sometimes we get caught in the, um we put ourselves in a predicament where we don't necessarily deliver some news that we don't want to deliver so we hold on to it and then we we sometimes will wait to the last minute to deliver that news each minute that we hold on to that news makes it a, a worse and worse experience for the people who are receiving that information um, so having that daily stand up and, and dropping the, that information of, hey, um, the leadership to as a leadership team, we've been thinking about this, you know, you know, no need to take action on it now, no need to worry about it now. But these are some of the thoughts and you know, like, it may, it may open up a conversation that you have internally with your team that you bring back to, you know, the upper, you know, senior leadership to say, hey, you know, our team felt like this, you know, we, we had a conversation about it. Um, but, but I definitely say, you know, that go, kind of goes back to the how to communicate. So different information should be communicated differently, I guess. I think uh, just to add into that, uh, cause it's something I think about a lot. Um, in business school, I remember learning basically like when delivering bad news, the suggestion is to sandwich it in between, oh, yeah. um, not necessarily good news, but to, to start and end with something that's more favorable and kind of clump it in the middle. Yeah. Um, and I think there's, there's a lot you can uh, kind of pull into other types of communication as well, where um, during this moment, I mean, it's like, you know, really recognizing that someone might be, it, it's, it's, there's a high, higher likelihood that somebody's having a, a difficult day um, or something like that. So um, kind of that concept of sandwiching communication where I try to, even if I write a communication that's really transactional, I try to be really conscious of, of that piece and try to add in, hope every, you know, hope, hope you're staying healthy and, and reasonably sane. During, you know, I try to add in a, a friendly um, note at the beginning because mm -hmm. I am seriously, uh, you know, concerned, but also uh, it's something that's so easy to forget. So I think it's, it's something that you can kind of train yourself to, to add in as well. Um, and, and I found personally that that's really strengthened my, my communicating, or at least I think it does. The good old feedback sandwich. <laughs> uh, does anyone else have anything they'd like to add to that? Yeah, I, I would. Um, for me, I, I'm totally uh, a culprit of this because I, I think that I'm being direct because um, I, I like to get straight to the point. I hate personally when someone gives me this wordy response and all I really needed was a sentence. So I... I I assume that others want their communication the same way. Um, and then I realize that when I am more direct, it can come off sort of cold or, you know, it loses that human aspect. So I've, I've started and made it a point to, uh, when I get to that point, just pick up the phone and call the person. Mm -hmm. That way I'm not, you know, lazy and just type in, you know, the short answer. And then we can have that dialogue. Yeah, I was going to, I just want to add to that. I was going to say that as well. So I may send like a hey message to the team. And if they respond like, hey, you know, what's up? I am quick to just 
start a meeting. I call all my team members. I'm like, hey, just want to talk to you. Like, I know we have teams and I know I can send a quick chat, but I'd rather see your face. I'd rather talk to you. So if you have some questions, you can see my body language, the tone that I'm delivering it. So you're not confused uh, about the message that I'm sending. So they're just like, oh my gosh, you just call on a whim. Yeah, I do. I want to see your face. What's going on? So yeah, it's cool. They appreciate it too. I mean, they think it's funny. They're just like, here's key again. Yeah, I miss you. Sorry, I got something to tell you. Sweet, sweet. Yeah. So we, we got, uh, what was that, three tours for the toolbox there? We got the feedback sandwich. We got the uh, picking up the phone. Then we got the... Uh, the instant virtual call. I like it. Hey Lee, I have a quick question. This mm -hmm. is Alyssa. I'm curious because I personally need a lot of, I enjoy a work environment that's a little bit more social, but in this pandemic and working remotely, my team uh, doesn't seem to need that. And I know that you're, you're, you're talking about communicating strategically. Um, I really try not to project my need for social interaction on the team. Um, but I also think that they need it, even if, like, even if they don't necessarily ask for it or seek it out. And do you have any suggestions for how I can kind of foster that organically? Mm. Uh, I, I guess um, one thing I, I like to, to see, like with some a situation like that is like if they have different suggestions on things that they like doing uh, or that interest them, uh, whether it be something that's, you know, unrelated to the work that we're doing or, or not. Like um, I know that, you know, I have one team member who does, um, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, and you know, I asked him if he would lead us, lead the team in a Dungeons and Dragons game, uh, and you know, we we didn't end up, you know, selecting that one to to do for our, you know, we had a late game day and we we voted on which ones, but we didn't end up selecting that one. But maybe see what some of the things that you know those team members are interested in, and indulge the team and kind of converge into something like that. Whether it's a game uh, or uh, some common interests of some sort, anyone anyone else have some other uh, ideas around something like that? Um, I know during our stand up, Alyssa. Hi, Alyssa. I'm rocking the house. Um, I know with um, with my team in the morning time. I'll start off with you know the old typical. Um, what you call it? Icebreaker question. But I, I kind of find a, a good one. And there's some good ones out there. I've even had it where um, I found something online where it's like, can you pick out the differences between two pictures? And so how I'll do that is like, okay, if you spot the difference, then whoever requests to have control from me first, I'll give them control and then they can point out the difference um, in the picture. So, I mean, I, I just keep it light and interactive, you know, maybe before, a little bit before our stand up, um, when I know that our work is getting done. And, and so I see that we have time to incorporate that in the beginning, but yeah. Um, and then I, ha I have a guy who has a book of dad jokes and I'm like, all right, Jacob, it, it's time for your dad jokes, give it to us. And they are horrible, but we all laugh at it because it's horrible. So, you know, th that's a good way to get social with your team. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with those. I think um, what, what Key points out and, and what we do for our team is it, it goes back to like the culture and cultivating that culture of just like, you know, we're a team, we're family and finding little ways, whether it's a dead joke or game or whatever, just to, to bring that social aspect. I know uh, for for us, uh, our team leader, uh, he has us like every every week someone owns the huddles and then they can 
uh, mow that huddle to, to whatever format they want. So, um, you know, some people use it to do would you rather questions. Some people do it, use it to ask more uh, interpersonal questions so that, you know, the team can get more connected. Uh, and I think that really helps uh, keep us grounded and, and keeps that human aspect um, within the team. This is Adam again. Um, I actually have a lot of fun with a lot of my meetings. Um, you know, we use Slack for a lot of things in WebEx, but um, if we're having a stand up in WebEx, I'll usually end up having to cut somebody off because they'll try to talk too much. But then when we're done, I'll immediately call them back via Slack and ask them to continue on that idea that they had and then roll that into just questions about their day or what's going on and try to carry that on for 10, 15 minutes and that way I'm not actually just making a call to them just to have it be a buddy, buddy call. I'm making a call to them to follow up on something that they were initially looking to talk about. And then I roll that into just chatting about their day. And I make a point to get everybody on the phone on a one-on-one -on -one without scheduling a one-on-one -on -one and making it feel like it's a, it's a businessy worky thing. And then roll that into just a loose conversation. And that's, I don't know if I haven't actually asked anybody if they like doing that or if they've even caught on that it's a thing that I'm doing. I think, I just kind of make it natural enough that, that we get that conversation going. I want to add to the social thing real quick. So we, we recently had an experience where uh, a suggestion came. We have a team in Uruguay and we have a team in India. Um, so lots of cultural differences between those teams, as you can imagine. Um, and we had a suggestion that came from our India team where basically it was to get as many people together as possible for a dance party that was DJed over Zoom, where everyone was encouraged to have their camera on. Ryan Robinson, who's on the chat, was the MC. It was amazing. Um, so just to put it out there, if you had asked me if that was a good idea, I would have told you no, because it seemed like something that was just not culturally conducive for the US team. Uh, <laughs> but it turned out that it actually was surprisingly <laughs> effective for uh, for both the U.S. and, and Uruguay teams. Uh, so the, I say that to say that, you know, sometimes your assumption, I, I, I let my own bias about what the team might want to do impact uh, me assuming uh, that I knew, you know, uh, socially what people would be into. So to some degree, I think sometimes you need to just try things and see what works because uh, you don't always even know what, what people might be into. So I encourage people to just like try some stuff. Yep. Keep throwing it at the wall and see what sticks. We've got trivia upcoming this Friday, so we'll see how that goes, too. Hey. What flavor? Ryan? What, what, what flavor trivia? <laughs> I think it's team trivia, Ryan, do you know? So it's um, a little bit of everything. So it's like a little bit of popular culture stuff mixed with our company stuff, um, but just, um, so that Altimetric folks on the call know, um, as of today, we're going to postpone it until next week. So stay tuned. <laughs> Let Jeopardy go on. But yeah, all, all great ideas to uh, kind of keep that, keep that, that spirit moving and, and just kind of trying different ideas out and seeing, seeing what sticks. All right, so I am going to hit this last piece quickly so we can get up out of here. Um, I, I feel like, you know, not that, uh, you know, I feel like we're having great conversation, but I do want to be mindful of folks' time and everything. Um, so this last piece is protecting your greatest asset, which is your team. Now, now we all are aware that, you know, the quarantine and the, this, uh, you know, corona is impacting people differently. Um, so it, it may impact one team member a ton. They may have, you know, they may have to take care of children. They you know, everyone's at home. They may have to um, take care of loved other loved ones, whether it be a, you know, a mother, father, auntie, uncle. Um, they may have other people in the house who may be depressed. Then you may have other team members who just, you know, they used to working from home. They worked from home for a long time, and they just ro rolling with the flow. Uh, but I think as leaders, we we have to understand that people, the way people respond to this pandemic will be across the spectrum. And we can't try to um, assume that, 
you know, certain people are doing well or certain people are, you know, having a difficult time, we have to open, you know, kind of leave it open for uh, just whatever that response that we receive from those team members. And, and I feel like in times like these, it is good for us to start drawing from authentic and servant leadership styles. Um, and it's a lot that we can learn from those approaches to leadership, especially uh, during difficult times. Um, I feel like during difficult times, it's more important for us to be there for our team members because that those team members are our business's life source. Like they're, they're the blood and, and plasma of the business. So that like without that, we, we really have nothing to lean on. Like we have no channel to get work done. So we have to be very careful with um, making sure that we create an environment for our team members to be successful. And uh, that is a lot of what servant leadership is about. Um, I, I'm gonna share, um, uh, I guess a, a Malcolm X had a speech um, and you know, you know, maybe, you know, may, you know, this is a completely different context from which it was delivered. Uh, but he, he talked about um, like, you know, you had you know, a field slave and you had a house slave. And oftentimes the house slave, you know, they would work really closely with the master and they would, um, whenever, they, whenever something was wrong with the master, you know, the house slave would say, oh, you know, there's something wrong with us. You know, you know if the master was sick, it's we sick. If the master was tired, we's tired. If the master was having a day, bad day, it's we're having a bad day. Like he would embody like that master to, the, to him, like he was one with that master. And like as a servant leader, we have to take, we have to take a lesson from that. We have to like look at our, our look at our look at our teammates and our team members as one. So if we have a team member who don't really have their goals in place, then we don't have our goals in place. If you have a team member who don't understand what's going on with the business, then we don't understand what's going we don't understand what's going on with the business. If we have a team member who's having a hard time dealing with the, the quarantine and the and the and what's going on with the uh, I guess the Corona uh, virus and the, the issues that's outside of the workplace, then we got a problem with, you know, those issues as well. And we have to work our darnest to try to resolve those and try to be there for that team member to create an environment where they can then be productive again. Um, like, like I said, team members will respond differently to, 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 to this whole pandemic. Um, but we have to work to try to figure that out and help them navigate through it. Because if they're not able to navigate through it, then they're not you know, being the most productive for themselves. And then that in turn's impact how they're, how they're being productive for the business. And, and I, I feel like it's a great time for us to kind of step back as leaders to really make sure that we're there for our team members. Because like beyond just the, the getting the work done, like we have a responsibility to make sure that the people that we're supposed to be taken care of, that they're, they're able and willing to do the work that they, that, they, uh, that they signed up to do and that they're really willing to dedicate their lives to. Um, so servant leadership, you know, it's about being selfless. Um, and then I wanna speak a little bit about authentic leadership, um, which is, uh, you just bringing your full self to the team. And a, a lot of what we've done today really lends to servant leadership and authentic leadership um, strategies um, or strategies pulled from servant leadership and authentic leadership. Uh, one of the big things about authentic leadership is having a great degree of self-awareness, really understanding like who you are and understanding like uh, I guess the, the, the backbone of like, why, why are you here? And really having the insight to look inside of yourself to kind of make refinements and to um, improve yourself on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, there is some research out there that really looks at um, an organization as a part of a self. And this kind of goes hand in hand with that selfless leadership. So, and when you're looking about, when you're talking about self-awareness and um, uh, self-reflection, 
it's not just reflecting about yourself and being aware of yourself, but it's also reflecting about your team and being aware about your team and being aware of the individual team members that you have. Um, and one of uh, like two, two big things that I, I want to point out for, for the self-awareness and us, us, I guess, vulnerability. So, and I guess in relationship to, you know, working in a crisis. Um, so in a crisis, you're vulnerable at, you know, at, at different levels. You're, you're, you know, it's a crisis happening, you're vulnerable. Like being, you know, when you're self-aware, you're, you're bringing that composure. So you're aware of the things that are inside and outside of your personal control, and you're able to distinguish which ones you want to cling on to and which ones you want to do something about. And that comes from self-awareness. And being able to do that as an individual and being able to do that as a team is very important because you can turn a, something that is a problem into a much larger problem if you don't have your composure as a leader. Or you can turn something that's a problem into something that's actually where we're finding benefits in it. And that, that comes from your composure. I, I reflect on one time, um, you know, I was, early into my uh, leadership at Amrock, one of my team members approached me. He, you know, he was very nervous. He was like, oh, Lee, man, we, we got a, a problem with the business. You know, the, you know we, we messed up 30,000 orders. It's like, ooh, mm. And it was one of the, uh, one of the, the, the tougher business owners uh, areas that we messed up these orders. And it was like, ooh, that's not good. Then uh, it's like, man, like, how am I supposed to tell them? We got, we got the meeting in, in like literally four minutes. It's like, uh, well, here, here, do you want me to communicate? It's like, I, yeah, but what, what are you going to tell them? I'm like, well, first, and I learned this from Kung Fu Panda. Master Uwe once said, there's no good news or bad news. There's only news. And that is like one of the most profound things that I found it like that movie had a lot of gems, but I will say that was one of the profound takeaways that I took from that movie. Like there's no good news or bad news. There's only news. And you deliver that news with um, the, the way, you know, with composure, whether it's good or bad. And, and that, that's what I told this team member. It's like, well, you know, there, there's no good news or bad news. There's only news. So we're, we're just going to tell them. As though it's just news. And then we're going to tell him that we're going to fix it because that's what we're going to do. And, you know, he was really nervous about it. We went into the meeting and you know, with a straight face, I said, so, yeah, we did our production push. We broke production <laughs> and we messed up about 30,000 orders. Uh, and we're looking into it at the moment. Uh, we have such and such over still at, at their uh, station looking into that. And we'll have more information at such and such time. And... You know, I waited for a second, looked around the room. Everybody was good. You know, I was good. And then he was just looking with a face of shock and awe. Just, it's like, man, how did you do this? Like, dude, you, you just, you have to have that composure as a leader. And that comes from having been vulnerable before and being able to learn how to be vulnerable and like how, like, and, and it comes from self-reflection and that, that self-reflection teaches you to use that vulnerability for a lesson later in life. Uh, so those are, are just two things um, around authentic leadership uh, that I want to, wanted to add to this conversation. Um, so uh, do anyone have any other additions to uh, authentic leadership and servant leadership in, in, I guess, response to a crisis and how they can draw from those things to um to make it easier for the team members to make it through these tough times. All right, sweet. But well, like I said, you know, we've been here for a good amount of time, y'all. Uh, and and uh, so I just want to recap what uh, we've gone over today uh, in this presentation. Uh, so the, the first thing was 
uh, make, maintaining values and the vision. So th those are the first things that we need and we need those prior to even entering the crisis. But if we don't have those prior to the crisis, it's never too late to really sit down with your team and determine what that vision is that's bigger than the individuals on that team that you're gonna reach towards uh, to make it, uh, to get you through the crisis. And then the values being those roots that really hold the team grounded and hold the team uh, together. Um, the, the second thing is just learning to embrace the storm. Like what are some of the benefits that we can pull from, from any crisis? And you know, at least you know, having that conversation to determine what those benefits are and then figuring out ways to really exploit those benefits to, to, to a way that you know, they're, they're worth celebrating. Um, and then next was, what was next? Can't find the beginning of my presentation. Oh, communicating. So communicating strategically, you know, making sure you're communicating the right information at the right time and making sure that everyone is eased based on the communication that you're given. And, and again, trying to anticipate uh, the communication needs of your team uh, and, and addressing the communications of needs of your team before they're even asking for them. Uh, and then lastly, um, prioritizing your greatest assets, you know, leveraging things that you can pull from uh, servant leadership and authentic leadership to really be your guiding light in terms of making sure you're taking care of your team members during this tough time. Uh, so that, that is all I have for you today. Uh, thanks, thanks again. Uh, I feel like everyone can, uh, added to the conversation and made it a lot more meaningful and a lot more impactful. Uh, and I thank again uh, Jacob and Ryan for allowing me to speak today. I had a good time and thanks for, thanks for joining y'all.